live from New York, it's World Gustafson Day. Welcome everyone. Thank you all for joining us. I'm Sol Klein, Dean of the Gustafson School of Business. I'm joined tonight by Adjunct Professor Robin Dyke, Honorary Gustafson Professor Kevin Roberts, and Suzanne Gerard Foote from the Tartan Group. We're here to celebrate the business school with you. We're turning 25 this year and are full of optimism and enthusiasm about our future. It's an exciting time for Gustafson as we continue to grow and expand on a global stage and deliver on our vision to pioneer business education that creates sustainable value. From our entrepreneurship programs in northern British Columbia and in Tunisia to our expanding master of global business delivered in Austria and Taiwan, France and Korea, Peru and the Netherlands, and soon to be in Japan and Turkey too, and our 80-plus student exchange partnerships in 36 countries. We're taking our expertise and sharing it with the world. Our alumni are the key ingredient in raising the profile of our school on a global stage. You are our greatest accomplishment and our greatest ambassadors. You see the world differently and are making it a better place. We're very pleased to celebrate our first World Gustafson Day with you. Over 500 alumni are joining us tonight from more than 25 locations around the world, with events in Victoria, Vancouver, and Prince Rupert, San Jose, Calgary, Toronto, Shanghai, and here in New York. I hope that you're all having fun there. Other alumni are signing in from Tirana to Tehran, from Dallas to Dublin, Halifax to Honolulu, Christchurch to Castlegar, Singapore to Sydney, Frankfurt to Fort St. John, and Winnipeg to Washington, and those are just the alliterations. It is wonderful to have you all connected with us. Tonight, we have a special treat in store for you. Kevin Roberts will share his insights on achieving success in a digital world. Kevin is executive chairman of Sachi & Sachi, one of the world's leading creative organizations, with over 6,500 people and 130 offices in 70 countries. Among his many accomplishments, Kevin is the author of Love Marks, The Future Beyond Brands, a groundbreaking business book published in 18 languages that shows how emotion can inspire businesses and brands to deliver sustainable value. Kevin is a world-renowned speaker with an uncompromisingly positive and inspirational leadership style and a set of values that matches our own. We were delighted to appoint him as an honorary professor at the Gustafson School earlier this year. You can tweet any questions you have for Kevin to hashtag Gustafson25, and we'll pose them to Kevin a little later on in the broadcast. Suzanne Gerard Foote, who's also a UVic alumna, will moderate the questions. After Kevin's talk, we'll also announce our 25 alumni to watch honoree. So without further ado, here is Kevin Roberts. Thank you very much, Saul. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever it is, wherever you are. Uh, you've all had your own reasons to uh, join this great movement of the Gustafsson School at UVic. I came sort of for one of the most primitive reasons ever. One of my mates asked me to. Robert and I go back to the 80s when we used to play rugby together, and we've spent a lot of time together since. And he said to me, look, I'm having a great time. I've got a great place on the water. I'm hanging out with a load of really, really, really smart kids. I've got to put up with the odd dean, but they don't last forever, so <laughs> don't worry about that part of it. You know, you should come up here. And I said, mate, it's, it's a long way from anywhere, really. He said, yeah, that's the point. That's the point, because we're sitting here on the edge of the world. We can do things that people in the middle can't do. A lot of empathy for that. I mean, if you think about Switzerland, what, I mean, what's come out of there? You know, chocolate, cuckoo clocks, Roger Federer. There's not a lot happening, okay? All sort of development comes from the edge. And he said, we look at things differently from here. I thought, wow, man, that's a pretty exciting thing. So I rocked up four or five years ago, had a ball, and I was amazed a year later because he asked me back. And that's very unusual. I very rarely get asked back. So I was pretty stoked by all that. And over the last two or three years, I've really got into it. I had a great time up there two or three months ago, and we were talking to the, to the current cohort about their hopes, dreams, fears, and all this kind of stuff. And it re 
really, their attitude towards learning was tremendous. They seemed uh, open, hungry, really, hungry. And tonight, Robin said, well, why don't you reprise part of what you told them? And I said, I got no idea what I told them, to tell you the truth. He said, well, you know, you were telling them about how they could win. And I said, oh, yeah, well, that would be right. Because for those of you that were anywhere near the, the, the U.S. The sort of sporting scene, NFL and all this stuff, you'll, you'll know who Vince Lombardi was. He was the coach, the coach of the century, I think. And he said, winning isn't everything, but wanting to win is. Man, I want to win so bad. And you must all want to win. That's why you chose to invest your time, your future at the Gustafson School. So why not talk about winning? Terrific. First thing it seems to me about winning is that when I first came up to the school, a lot of people told me, hey, you know what? We are a world-class institution. OK, that's a shame. I said, you know, because that would be embarrassing for me. They said, what do you mean? It's really aspirational. I said, are you kidding me? World class just means average. It means there's like 10 of you that are pretty good, and you're all being world class. That's not good enough. That's not what we're trying to do here, is it? We don't want to be world class. We want to be world changing. And I had these bunch of students sort of standing on the tables going, yeah, yeah, man, that's us. That's what we want to do. We want to change our worlds, the worlds that we know, the world that we came from. And we want to change it for the better in every sense of the world, uh, at word. And we think we can do that from here. So winning for me is about a mindset that says, in this crazy world that we live in, we're going to not just sort of get things done the way most students and grads do. We're going to be committed to making things happen. Okay? So three things that struck me. Uh, as I was thinking about talking to you tonight. The first thing, I guess there's three ideas that I'm going to talk about, right? The first thing is we live in what... I was at the Pentagon a, f a few months ago uh, in front of these um, very sort of heavy-hitting American military types, okay, including a five-star U.S. general. I don't know about you. I didn't even know that generals had five stars. I thought only hotels had five stars. But apparently in the U.S., because everything's sort of bigger and better in America, they have five-star generals, not just three or four stars. This five-star general and stuff told me, listen, sonny boy, uh, you don't really understand this geopolitical macro stuff, <laughs> right, being the expert on foreign policy that we are in the U.S. military. That, and we live in a VUCA world. And I said, yeah, yeah, that would be right having no idea what he was talking about, of course. And he said, yeah, we live in a world that is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. VUCA. Volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. I said, yeah, 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 I knew that. In fact, I said, if you live in the places I've lived in, like New Zealand, like Saudi Arabia, like Argentina, uh, for instance, Argentina, that's been a VUCA world since the day it was invented. If you live in Italy, Every day is VUCA. So there is no real news in this. We like the VUCA life, huh? We like it here. I said, in fact, listen, Mr. General, Lord Star, Five Star, whatever stars you got, Mr. Ritz Carlton here, actually, up in Victoria, where I teach, we have moved from a VUCA world to a super VUCA world. <laughs> Super because I'm in advertising, after all. In advertising, everything's super, right? Super model, super league, super size, super VUCA. A world that's vibrant, full of life, full of hope, full of optimism, full of grads like you who want to make things happen. It's a world that is unreal. In the past, to change things up, to change things in the world, you had to have money, power, scale, resource. That's why the big got bigger, the small got smaller, the haves got more, the have-nots got less. You don't need that stuff now. The only thing you need now to change the world is an idea. We live in the age of the idea. It is ideas that are currency of our millennium. And great ideas come from everywhere. And more of them come from the edge. The further you are away from the murky middle, 
the more ideas you're going to get. In a super VUCA world, which is vibrant and unreal, it's also a world for the crazies. Now, I'm seriously crazy, okay? I have no fear of anything. That's a crazy position, and I can tell you it's true. And we need crazy, crazy people. Many of you, when you told them that they were, you were going up to Victoria, probably said, well, you're crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Almost every one I've met that graduated said, man, it was the greatest thing I ever did. It was a really good fit for me. And we need crazy people. Why? Because they are the only people that will protect and nurture an idea because ideas are the most fragile things in the world. Everybody can kill an idea. Everywhere you go, you will bump into the abominable no man. And he will tell you no, why your idea, why work, why it's too expensive, why it's against every law known to mankind, why it's been tried before, we haven't got the money, all this is nonsense. Get him out of your way. We do not need the cynics and contrarians. Let them go to Toronto where they belong. We need them to be radical optimists, nothing else. We need crazies. In a super VUCA world, it's astounding. It's astounding how fast all this can happen. You just see what's happening with technology. It connects us. It connects us wherever we are. We have a good idea, man, boom. It's worldwide in three hours. Click, boom, click, boom. So that's the super VUCA world. You want to live in that super VUCA world. Do not let these Muppets take you back into a VUCA frightened world. That's not for us, okay? We're 25 years young. We have the right, we have the permission to misbehave. Remember your ABCs. Yeah? Ambition, belief, and courage. Ambition, you've all got that. That's why you came. Belief, that's the greatest competitive advantage you can have. And then the courage to go through with it. So that's sort of my first thought. Live in a super VUCA world. The second thought is get yourself fired up for something bigger than yourself. Martin Luther King did not stand up and say, I have a vision statement. He had a dream. Okay? For any of us to succeed, we need a dream. Our companies need a dream. We need a dream for our kids. We need a dream for ourselves. And a real one, not just a little sort of goal or objective or strategy. I'm talking about something we'll never achieve. Something that we can't reach. It's not about achieving it and, and, and reaching it. It is about just trying to reach for those stars. It's not about counting them and measuring them and all this big data stuff. It's about emotionally having a dream that turns you on, that makes you happy, that makes you make happy choices in everything you do. Forget this work-life balance nonsense. Who wants to balance anything? You should avoid moderation at all costs. We don't want to balance. We want to explode our lives. You want to live the best life you can. It's work-life integration that we should search for. How do we integrate? How do we become the best friend, the best lover, the best parent, the best person at work that we can be? Not by balancing it, but by reaching every time and finding new ways to make happy choices. And that all starts with identifying your dream. It starts with identifying that your own one word equity. What is that one word that sets you apart and makes you different, that makes you irresistible to everyone you come into contact? What is that for the business? What is that noun or adjective that makes you impossible to overlook, that makes you unstoppable? Then just ask yourself a couple of questions. When am I best? What will I never do? Ask those remorseless, tough, hard questions, and then make all your decisions from there. So what's your one word equity? When are you at your best? What will you never do? And what is your dream? What is your dream? When you've got that figured out, go find a company or a business that delivers four things, all in equal parts every day. Work for a company or develop your own company and give people responsibility, learning, recognition, and joy. Responsibility. Give them responsibility before they're ready. 
Give them learning. Fail fast, learn fast, fix fast. Give them recognition. Everybody works better when they're given unconditional love and support, ideally with lots of money as well and lots of time off and you can bring your dog to work. Okay? So you've got to give people responsibility, learning, recognition, and you've got to expect it yourself and give it back to them. Give it to your customers, your clients, your family, your boss, your subordinate. Give it to everybody. Even, even at the airline check-in desk, give it to the Muppet who's sitting there and making your life miserable. Give it to all of them and they will reciprocate and you will have an amazingly successful career and in fact life. So that's the second thought, right? Get yourself purpose-driven with a dream and uh, find a place that delivers responsibility, learning, recognition, joy. Final sort of thought, right? What makes a successful company today? We've done loads and loads of work and studies on this kind of stuff. We've boiled it down to an equation that I wrote in a moment of madness after my sort of third bottle of very good Bordeaux at 3 o'clock in the morning. And the equation looks like IQ plus EQ plus TQ plus BQ, all powered by CQ. Okay, can we all repeat that in the audience over here? Did you get that, Reggie? I think I nailed it. IQ plus TQ plus... TQ and BQ. (laughs) Ask the current guard. All powered by CQ. Yeah, way to go. Okay, what's IQ? Okay, table stakes. You've got to be part of a company and run a company that is peopled with smart people, not with Muppets, okay? The Muppet Show is great entertainment, but it doesn't win in the business field. Okay, so you're all smart people. You've already proved that. Your IQ's already been tested, okay? EQ, obviously. Emotional quotient, okay? When I give this speech in Switzerland or Germany, they look at me like this, and they ask me, what does he mean? Okay, so EQ is the way that we feel empathy, the way that we have intuition, we have instinct. We can feel the rhythm of a business, the rhythm. It's not knowing what consumers or people say or do that counts. Anybody knows that. Thank you, big data. It's knowing how they feel that makes the difference, which is much harder. You need EQ to eat. And if you're a guy and you're thinking about women, God help you, I think you need a miracle as well as EQ. So IQ and EQ, and then TQ, technology quotient. You cannot fake it, okay? Technology is a part of our world, but many of us, particularly the millennials who work for me, the average age at such and such is 27. They have now become enslaved by technology, not the other way around. Technology is there to liberate, to free us, to help us. Technology is Uber, so I never have to get into a smelly New York taxi again. That's great technology. Technology is not interrupting me constantly on my mobile with idiotic messages. So TQ, let's master technology, make it work for us, not be its slave. And finally, BQ. So we've got intelligence quotient, emotional quotient, technology quotient, and BQ, bloody quick. You've got to get onto this stuff right now, okay? Speed is the new black. Velocity is what counts in this world. The rate of change is like grease lightning. All powered by CQ. What is CQ? Creativity. Okay, I would say that because I work for a creative organization. But in any business, you have the scientific-driven innovation. That's important. You have some Disney-like imagination. That's important. But right square at the... tipping point of that spear is creativity in everything we do. Creativity, it is the unreasonable power of creativity that makes the difference because it is that that drives ideas. And the culture with the most ideas wins. Not the most big ideas. Big ideas now all come from having 20 small ideas. And then the consumers, the customers, Fans, likes, make a small idea, suddenly a big idea. Don't waste your time searching for that big idea. Instead, build a culture where you're getting lots and lots of ideas out there fast, and you're very empathetic to consumers and customers, and one of them will turn out to be a real, real biggie. So I'm pretty excited at welcoming you to, to where I work. Um, uh, here in New York. I'm very excited uh, and honored to be part of the Gustafson School, and I'm very grateful for that.
because the students and cohorts I've come into contact with are truly different because they have made a conscious choice, a conscious decision to break away from the mainstream and the murky middle and to do something different. We're going to honor 25 sort of these edgy players later on, and I've been involved in looking at them, and I can tell you, I don't know how you got them down to a short list of 25. Well done. Sort of 25 or 50 people have missed out this time around, but there are some very neat alumni to watch uh, coming up. So thank you all very much. We're here now to answer any questions, sing any songs. You can ask anything that you like, whether it's about rugby, politics, you know, anything you want, and I'll tell you the truth. Come on, baby, it's all yours. The moment you've been waiting for. <laughs> Thank you. What a wonderful presentation. I so thought, inspiring. Yeah, I can see the audience yeah. going mad over here. Incredible. So you wow. guys watch Letterman? <laughs> I mean, he's funnier, but he's finished. Sorry. You're, that was very funny. So thank, oh, you, thank you for your much. presentation. That was fantastic. So inspiring. I am so inspired and so charged up, and I know everyone else is here, all of the alum. Um, so I, thank you for your questions that have come in over tweets and those that you've sent in. And I just, I'm going to go through a couple of them for you. The first one we have is actually from Victoria. And it is, what is one thing you'd like to accomplish that you haven't yet? Uh, yeah, I'd like to live to be 100 and enjoy all my grandkids. Next, it's your turn now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Just it. letting you elaborate if uh, you needed no, no, to. Would you, I need to elaborate on that. I've <laughs> no. got five grandkids. That's wonderful. And they're aged from one to seven. I'd love to see them all grow up. Beautiful, beautiful. Then I'd Thank be as you. old as Robin. <laughs> <laughs> and this one's from Toronto. What is the one word that sets you apart? That objective, that object, the adjective that makes it impossible to be overlooked. Yeah, well, for me, I used to be called the disruptor, right? Arnold Schwarzenegger, you all know, is the terminator, right? I and you're like the disruptor. That. George Bush was a, I'm the decider, which is sort of a, a neat idea coming from him. But uh, so I used to be the disruptor when I was younger because I used to like to disrupt things and change things. Mm -hmm. Now mm -hmm. I really try to become the inspirer, so not just to disrupt things. But to actually say to people, listen, the thing that drives me, that really turns me on, is inspiring you to be the best you can be in pursuit of your dream. Yeah. So I want to be inspirational in everything I, I touch, because that is at, at my very core and my very heart. I've been inspired by so many people growing mm -hmm. up, by mm -hmm. mentors and guides and people like that, that it was the most effective, it was life changing for me on a sort of constant basis, right, being mentored. Yeah. And I want to give that back. Because I enjoy it, it turns me on too, frankly. Right, you are inspiring. I, we find you so inspiring. And here is one from Prince Rupert, British Columbia. What was one of your favorite marketing campaigns you've worked on and your favorite part of the process when building the marketing campaign? Yeah, I'm not big into process, to tell you the truth. So, okay. But the first part of the question, I was the president and CEO of Pepsi Cola Canada mm -hmm. in the late 80s when we drove Pepsi past the mighty Coca-Cola for the first time in the history of, uh, of, of, the, of Canada, actually. Wow. And uh, it was driven by a couple of things. One, mistakes made by Coke, who, who blinked, and they brought in new Coke based on a lot of research rather than based on EQ. High IQ, but low EQ, with all the Coca-Cola drinkers saying, listen, you guys in Atlanta, you do not own Coke. Just because Pepsi beat you in taste test, we, the Coca-Cola drinker, don't care. We love our Coke, and they poured all this new Coke all over the streets. That was a very enjoyable time for me. And then we did a thing called the Pepsi Challenge where we drove them crazy, and then we brought in Michael Jackson and Tina Turner. And in Quebec, we had this amazing, uh, I mean, in Quebec, as you probably know, people are called Pepsis. <laughs> uh -huh. So the most exciting thing that I ever did was be part of with all these bunch, and we had the, the model, business model was different. Coca-Cola owned all their bottling systems then in Canada. And we at Pepsi, when I was there, decided that that was the wrong model and that we had all local Pepsi bottlers, 46 of them all around the country. So I worked with these 46 Canadian entrepreneurs on the streets, in the hockey stadia, in the schools. It was fantastic. And we went past them. Of course, it came to a, you know, a, a, a more difficult end because, you know, as in any wars, you know, uh, Coca-Cola came back and... By that time, I'd gone. 
The second most best thing I worked on was for Team New Zealand in the oh, America's really? Cup. Oh, my God. When we uh, went, little tiny New Zealand, which is four million people, yes. okay, uh, went up against Larry Allison and all the giants of America's Cup. And we all came together as one and we said, you know, we've got the best sailors. We don't have much else, but we have ABC, ambition, belief, and courage. And we put together a campaign where the whole focus of all New Zealand and everyone around us, including sponsors, they had only one thing in mind, which was, how can we help make the boat go faster? And that's all we focused on. We had a, a, a talk with uh, Yoshi Ishizaka, who was the global CEO of Toyota. And he said, I really love what you guys are going to try and do. So we want, we're going to help you because we think this will be a global thing. We want to support the underdog because we're the underdog against Volkswagen and General Motors and all these things. And we like the speed and we like the transport. And we like all this. So we'll give you $100 million. And I was one of the four trustees. And I said, that's fantastic, Yoshi. So I cannot tell you, but no thanks. And he did what you were doing then. His eyes sort of glazed over and he I'm looked at me sure. like I was completely sure. crazy. And I said, we don't want that. What we want is we want 30 of your engineers to live with us for the next five years and teach our sailors how to make the boat go faster. Wow. Because you guys know all about QDR, quality, durability, reliability. Mm -hmm. You guys know all about Kaizen, you know, continuous improvement. Mm -hmm. And he said, Kevin San, I've never been so impressed. Of course you can have them. And I said, that's fantastic. And we like the 100 million too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> of course. Of course. And he said, of course. And you don't even look Japanese. <laughs> well, that was, that's a, those are two great, great stories. Thank you. OK, let me see where else we have one coming in from. OK. So this one is from Vancouver. Creativity is a huge part of your business. Are there ways someone who isn't naturally creative can cultivate this skill? That's I have question. never met a non-naturally creative person. Have you ever met a three-year-old who wasn't the most creative person in the world? They're creative. They are creative as hell. They're born creative. I once worked with Henry Kissinger. Remember him? Big guy, right? Henry, and he was a fantastic negotiator. And I was sent to him to learn a very advanced level negotiation skills. And they sent me to him because he was, at the time, the most famous negotiator in the world. And he just started a consultancy. Cost a lot of money, I think. Anyway, we went, so I rock up and I go there. And I'm quite you know, nervous. I mean, this is Henry Kissinger, right? So I go, and then he's there, and he's sitting down at his table. He's a big bloke. And he looks a bit like Saul, right? He does. <laughs> Big bloke, you know, mm, like this. He's drinking coffee. And he didn't even look up, so he's drinking coffee. And he goes, who's the best negotiator in the world? And I, I mean, he was always talking to me because nobody else in the room. So I, I said, well, I hope you are, because we've been just paid 100,000 bucks for this. <laughs> He says, you're stupid. I thought, oh, shit, it's not going very well. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't know. Can you tell me? He says, a three-year-old child. Because the, and he said, because they have the five whys. Five whys. Yeah, why? 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 Because I said so, that's why? <laughs> Doesn't really wash. Doesn't move forward. They've out-negotiated. They've won, and you give them it. Right? So we were all born creative. And then what happened is schools, education systems, fear, peer pressure knocked the hell out of us. So what I would say to this guy who asked me the question, or girl, whoever it was, think like a three-year-old. Act like a three-year-old. Do that with four or five people for an hour. You boys do that quite a lot at about 11 o'clock tonight, is what I've heard. <laughs> so do it sober. And then your creativity will rip. Fantastic. Thank you. We have another one from Victoria. I, I have to ask, who do you think will win the, rug, the Rugby World Cup later this year? Yeah. <laughs> well, the All Blacks, uh, uh, I was on the board of the All Blacks for four years, and uh, we're the current holders, as you know. No team in the history of the Rugby World Cup since 1987 has won back-to-back uh, World Cup. So your distinguished adjunct professor, Robin Dyke, is coming over with me to be present when that is decided at Twickenham on October, October 30. 
uh, I've been closely involved with the coaching of the All Blacks, and I've been asked by England to help them. And England's got a dream, which is to win Rugby World Cup yeah. in their home country. And they're very proud of that. The All Blacks' dream is different. The All Blacks' dream is to be the best rugby team that ever played the game. To be the best rugby team that ever played the game. One of the manifestations of that will be to win back-to-back -back World Cups. But the dream is so much bigger than just to win the World Cup. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I was talking about earlier is that when you do write that dream, when you do come up with your dream, make sure it is a big dream. All your life you've been taught you have to achieve your goals, achieve your aims. Park that for this. This is about having the biggest dream possible. Because as Disney said, you know, if you can dream it, you can do it, but it won't be so easy. So I hope the All Blacks will win. Okay. I think England, Australia, South Africa, France and Wales and Ireland all have chances and they'll all play very well and then we'll win. I think that we'll be very happy to hear your thoughts on that. We have time for one more quick question. The um, more important question on rugby, I'm sorry for okay. any rugby lovers today, is that this weekend is a huge, huge thing for the future of rugby in Canada and the United States because in Carolina on Saturday and Sunday, uh, NACRA has its seventh qualifying tournament for Rio Olympics 2016. It is probable that the USA will meet Canada in the final. One of them will join seven other teams to go to Rio to get worldwide coverage to play in the sevens in the Olympics and bring back Olympic gold for either Canada or the US. So you watch it. It's live on NBC, I think, uh, on Saturday and Sunday. It's about 3.40 Carolina time will be the final, all blacks and Canada. Okay. Uh, America and Canada. Okay. We'll be watching for that. Very, just a few moments to end with, but there's such, so great questions. Thank you very much. But um, Mr. Robert, what's the biggest failure you've had and what did it teach you? Yeah, I never learned anything from failure. I just, <laughs> they give me the shit to tell you the truth. I learned more from winning and from success and from building on it. I never look back. So I only look at the future. I don't do a lot of this academic reflection. Sorry, I can't help you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Pleasure. We're just going to take a moment, and um, Saul and Robin will come on back out. Thank, Thank you. Very you. Much. Thank you, Kevin. It's not often we get to hear Henry Kissinger, three-year-olds, and rugby in the same <laughs> speech. It was wonderful. And thank you, alumni, for sending in your questions. I'd now like to invite Robin Dyke to join me as we announce- Hi out there. <laughs> we announce our 25 alumni to watch honorees. Last fall, we put out a call looking for alumni who embodied the school spirit of seeing things differently. We were looking for alumni who have a global mindset and an international perspective who are creative, innovative risk takers, who are committed to sustainability and social responsibility initiatives, and are a source of inspiration and motivation for others as role models and leaders in their professions and community endeavors. You did not disappoint, and you did not make it easy on the selection committee. <laughs> we had our work cut out for us, narrowing the field to 25 alumni to watch. Our congratulations go to Wild Bowen, MBA 2013. Janet Bonaguro, MBA 2005. Paul Chaddock, MBA 2007. Bennett Coles, MBA 2007. 
Kim Cope, BCom 2013. Jill Earthy, MBA, 1998. Andrew Hall, BCom 2011. Jeffrey Harris, MBA, 1995. Shelby Hedges, BCom 2010 and MGB 2012. Wow. Derek Juno, BCom 2011. Maya Cunningham, BCom 2000. Paul King, BCom 2012. Christian Kittleson, MBA 2006. Goldie Luong, MBA 2005. Jennifer McKenzie, MBA 2000. Danielle McComb, BCom 2010 and MBA, MGB. MGB, pardon me, 2011. Tim Morris, MBA 2004. Chantelle Show, BCom 2003. And Mike Show, BCom 2003. Uh, Greg Smith, BCom 2000. Michael B. Smith, BCom 2003. Michaela Tkokarski, MBA uh, 2001. Sorry on that, Michaela. Daniela Wieslow, MBA 2009. Sybil Virch, BCom 1997. And Jane Zhu, MBA 2006. Congratulations to oh. all of you, the 25 of you on this well-deserved recognition. To all the rest of our alumni out there, you can learn about each recipient's story in the spring issue of Business Class, now available on our website. But remember, these are only some of the incredible stories about our alumni. We have 5,000 more waiting to be told. Those could be yours. Kevin, I'd like you to join us again. Thank you. <laughs> Kevin, thank you very much for joining us. Um, on behalf of the Gustafson School of Business, uh, you've inspired us. We're incredibly grateful for all of the support that you've given to the school um, at events like this, delivering workshops for our students, for our, for our mentors, for the business community, for engaging our students in exciting, innovative projects with Sachi and Sachi. Um, we wanted you to be a part of this special day in particular because your philosophy, your approach, fits so well with what we do at the Gustafson School. Mm. Again, you truly inspired us, and thank you very much for your ongoing inspiration. Thank, thank you, you. Thank you very much. And may I add mine, Kevin, thank you. Uh, you have made me very happy, and you've also scared the shit out of me, because <laughs> my one word for you is reminder. So you remind me of my dream, but you also challenge me to make sure that I actually do something about <laughs> it. And I'm ever grateful for you for that. Uh, we have dubbed Kevin over time, either behind the scenes or to your face, in terms of the presentation gifts we've given you over time, as the Raven. But I would add to that, because of the magical as well as the transformational qualities of the Raven in mythology. But I think I now have to add Super Raven. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, Kevin. Thank you very much yeah. indeed, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you. That was great. Good. Goodbye out there. And change thank, the world. Thank you all for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure to be here with you. Please stay in touch with us. And also watch out for our newest initiative. This is one we will launch in two weeks' time, the Gustafson Brand Trust Index. We will identify the most trusted brands in Canada and demonstrate the linkage between responsible management practices and customer responsiveness. So congratulations again to our 25 alumni to watch, and happy World Gustafson Day to you all. It's great to be 25. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. Good night.